This is TTT Live. I'm Mahalia Joseph Wharton. The Ministry of Health is giving an update on the status of COVID-19 in Trinidad and Tobago. We're bringing you live coverage on TTT Talk City 91.1 FM and on Facebook at TTT Live Online. We go now to Senior Corporate Communications Officer at the Ministry of Health, Al Alexander. Good morning, Trinidad and Tobago. We are pleased to have you join us for today's virtual media conference by the Ministry of Health as we seek to keep you informed and updated on the national COVID-19 response. Here to discuss the COVID, latest COVID-19 updates with us are the Honorable Terence Dial Singh, Minister of Health, Dr. Roshan Parasram, Chief Medical Officer, Ministry of Health, Dr. Avery Hines, Technical Director, Epidemiology, and Dr. Michelle Trotman, Thoracic Medical Director at the Cora Hospital. We also have Dr. Brian Amor, Chief Executive Officer, Southwest Regional Health Authority. I am Al Alexander, Senior Corporate Communications Officer at the Ministry of Health, and I will be the moderator this morning. We now go to Dr. Parashram, who will present today's clinical update. Dr. Parashram. Hi, good morning. Thanks, Al. Oh, morning to the Honourable Minister, morning to Dr. Trotman, Dr. Hines, Dr. Amor, and the GM of Nursing from Southwest. Good morning to members of the media, members of the viewing and listening public. So I'll be giving the clinical update for this morning, which is as of 4 p.m. yesterday, the 13th of April 2021, at both public and private facilities, 118,247 tests completed thus far. Over the last 24 hours, 70 reported um, new cases, which are from the period taken the 10th to the 12th of April, giving us a total of 8,511 cases since the 12th of March 2020. Total recovered patients thus far now stand at 7,799, and a total active case load at 566, with 420 of those in self-isolation at home, 71 persons in hospital, and 5 persons at step-down, our deaths now stand at 146. A breakdown of the hospital figures. We have 47 persons at the Coover Hospital and Multi-Training Facility, six of those in ICU, two of those in HDU, at the Cora Hospital, four persons, and at the Scarborough Regional Hospital at Fort King George, there are 20 persons. With regards to our repatriates and quarantine sites, total of 247 persons at the Cape Oak Hotel 69, Cascadia 28, Regent Star 15, Trade Winds Hotel 11, Paria Suites 12, Cara Suites 12, Chancellor Hotel 7, the Napa 21, Debe 4, Canada Hall 35, and we have three vessels. The Ocean Moon has 13 persons, Springbook MV 8 persons, MV Boko 11, and SMC 1 person. Al, that's my clinical update for this morning. Thank you very much. Let us now focus on our attention on the epidemiological update, right? Sorry, let us now focus our attention on, on, on the epidemiological update by Dr. Avery Hines. Dr. Hines? Thank you, Mr. Alexander. Good morning to the Minister. Good morning to my colleagues, Dr. Parasram, Dr. Trotman, Dr. Moore, and the GM of Nursing for Southwest. Uh, may I have the first slide, please? We'll go quickly into the epidemiologic update, and this was the data given by the CMO. Uh, the only thing I have to add here is that as at yesterday at 4 p.m., there had been over 10,000 individuals vaccinated. Next slide, please. Now, this is an interesting and a different slide from what we normally show. This is really showing the cumulative cases over the time frame from the start of that second wave. <clears throat> and what we see is at the top left hand corner something that we refer to as the doubling times for the number of cases that we have actually diagnosed and we would note that in that early period in july in august september the number of cases had doubled every eight to ten days after we imposed the uh, mask wearing uh, at the end of august we saw that the doubling time lengthened meaning the epidemic began to slow so it lengthened to 19 days and from that time to April the 5th, it took another nearly six months, actually six and a half months, in order for those cases to double again. 
Uh, what we can't see because of the uh, square at the top right is that just beyond April the 5th, we are seeing, oh, thank you, a change in the direction of this graph where it's now starting to go up as opposed to curving towards the flat. And that is a cause for concern that shows increasing numbers in this, uh, in this latter period. Next slide, please. Now, what we have here is some potential projections. And the three most colorful lines, the red, the gray, and the green, were projections made since the month of December, looking at potential scenarios where we had increasing increments, decreasing or constant increments in terms of numbers of new cases. The blue bars, the blue section, really shows what happened in real time uh, as against the projections. And we saw that between the end of 2020 and uh, now, we did have slightly less than the, a constant uh, number of cases. We had, we had been seeing some slowing. But as we move towards the end of that uh, blue section, again, we see that upward turn, which suggests that we are now having increasing numbers and we're actually moving upwards. That, uh, no, let's go back. The gray and the yellow uh, lines that are shown there show two projections. Let's go back a slide. And those are looking at the rate of increase over the past month. That's the, uh, sorry, the purple line is the rate of, of increase over the past month. And if we look at the rate of increase only over the past two weeks, that's the yellow line. And we do see that we are having a significant change in the speed and slope of that graph projected moving towards the end of this month. So next slide, please. What we also have is our typical, the epidemic curve showing January in green, February in blue, March in orange, and April in purple, with that rolling black line demonstrating the seven-day rolling average. And if we can see it clearly, we can see that that rolling black line has taken a steep upward turn and continues upward at this point in time, another cause for concern. Next slide, please. Looking at that same data, but aggregated by month as opposed to by week, we see, next slide, we see that the same pattern and the same pattern of colors prevails. Uh, looking at the right-hand end of this graph, we see March in orange, April in purple. That last bar showing that we are in the week 15. Week 15 isn't finished yet, so it's an incomplete week. But the background color, that salmon section, showing our levels of positivity, meaning the number or the per percentage of individuals who have been tested for respiratory illness and have come back as positive for COVID-19. And we see that that would have increased from around 2 to 3% in February, or they were up to about 15% at the current time. Next slide, please. We also have the demographic slides, both of them side by side here, showing total cases and the age sex distribution. Nothing new on this slide. 55% of the total cases in that 25 to 49 age group and 53% of them being men as opposed to 47% being women. In the fatalities, we see that 3 to 1 ratio, 74% of the fatalities being among men, and almost 70% of them being in that 60 and over age group. Next slide, please. Now, the geographic progression we're looking at is from week 8, where we were in a relatively good place, through to week 14. So let's go to the first slide. Week 8, here we see yellow dots showing the new cases for week 8 and the purple showing the previous cases for week 7. And as we move forward, the cases for the previous week will turn to purple. So the week 8 cases will turn to purple and week 9 will show up as yellow. Next slide. So we see the distribution, small numbers, small clusters throughout the country. Next slide. Week 10, we began to actually see an increase. And we saw that increase beginning in County Kearney. And next slide then spilling over into the neighboring counties of County Victoria. Next slide, please. And uh, County St. Patrick. And as we continue, next slide. Next again. Next again. Next again. As we continue, what we see is that increase starting to show up now along the east-west corridor, all the way from St. George West through St. George Central and St. George East, with smaller increases in Nerva Mayaro and St. Andrew St. David. Next slide, please. And then we see a significant jump in the number of yellow dots, meaning the number of cases that are new for the week, if we move to the next slide, that are seen to populate the east-west corridor and are sustained in that 
uh, County Kearney and County Victoria and County St. Patrick location if we, if we move forward to the next slide. So let's just move forward one slide, then move forward another in rapid succession so we can see that change. Thank you. So we see the change, larger clusters of those yellow dots in the east-west corridor and even more in what we call week 14. Next slide, please. So if we look at that graphically, the poster on a map, what we see is we have the counties in groups and the bars representing each of those epidemiologic weeks from week 8 moving through to week 14. And, uh, the, and that's moving from left to right. We see that County Kearney would have held fairly steady comparing week 13 with week 14, minimal change if any in counties Kearney and the River Mayaro, but much larger changes in uh, County St. George Central, St. George East and St. George West. And although the numbers are small, they have actually doubled in St. Andrews St. David. What we can't see again because of the uh, translation or the sign language square is the ones for Tobago and Victoria. So if we could just move that for one moment. The, see, we see that Victoria did go up slightly, while Tobago had a slight downward trend from last week to this week. We will see how that pans out as we move into the two-week post-Easter period. So that brings me to the end of the epidemiologic update. And I'll turn it back over to Mr. Alexander. Thank you very much, Dr. Hines. I now invite Dr. Michelle Trotman to remind us of some necessary COVID-19 measures that we should all be taking, that we should all be using. Dr. Trotman. Honorable Minister of Health, Minister Dian Singh, CMO Dr. Pasram, my colleagues Dr. Hines, Dr. Amo, and also GM Nursing Southwest, members of the listening and viewing public and members of the media. The presentation by Dr. Hines puts the moment in context. It is quite clear that we are in the middle of an upsurge in the cases of COVID-19 in Trinidad and Tobago. This is serious. It is time for us to stand on our basic principles. When it comes to COVID-19, the preventative measures that are not just needed at this time, but absolutely essential. We know how the virus spreads. People come together. It jumps from person to person. It uses things like our orifices, mouth, nose, for particles to come out and get to each other, and also surfaces. Therein lies the principles upon which the preventative measures stand. Distance, six meters, so that the virus cannot jump from person to person. Often we see people congregate when they're talking. They tend to come closer together. Even in the place of work, they come closer together to get the message across. Please remember that we need to keep that distance in order to prevent the virus from jumping from person to person. Distance. Sanitize. We said these particles need a surface, your hands, your surfaces. So the reasons why we emphasize this cleanliness is not to allow and give the virus the opportunity to spread. Masking. Again, an extremely poignant part of the presentation with Dr. Hines showed the difference that the masking made for us when we introduced it at the end of August. So it works. It's not a question mark. We have the data and the figures to show that we wear our masks over our nose and our mouth, not under our chin. Again, a lot of us see each other with the mask pegged on the air, but under the chin. It's not useful there. We need to mask and mask up effectively. So I am imploring population of Trinidad and Tobago. I read a world, we're in a pandemic. 
to get together while being distanced, while sanitizing, while masking as a nation. I always give you the acronym DSM. Distance, sanitize, and mask. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Trotman. I now invite the Honorable Minister of Health to address you. Honorable Minister. Thank you very much, Al. Uh, good morning to the Chief Medical Officer, Drs. Trotman, Dr. and Dr. Hines. Um, ladies and gentlemen of the media, viewing and listening public wherever you are, a very happy Wednesday morning to you. Um, it is my duty and job now to inform the national population of where we are with certain um, policy decisions, strategic issues. So I will start with the vaccine rollout program. I am pleased to announce that over the past two days, we have been topping over 1,800 doses per day. You will remember the original target was 1,000 per day, but we are now clocking way in excess of that. I will also like to confirm what most people already know. Um, thanks to the cooperation between the governments of people of uh, Trinidad and Tobago, the Honorable Prime Minister and his counterpart in India, the Honorable Narendra Modi, we did receive last night 40,000 doses of Covishield vaccines manufactured by the SSI of India, for which we are thankful. These vaccines have an expiry date of July 18th, which is pretty good. What this now means is that the COVAX shipment we receive of 33,000, you may recall we were going to make a decision as to whether we stop at 16,000 or use out all. We have now made the decision after consultation with the Chief Medical Officer and everyone else, especially in light of the fact that we have in our hands the 40,000 doses expiring July. We will now be using out all of the 33,600 in this first phase. So that means with the 33,600 and the 40,000, um, we can now vaccinate roughly about 35, 36,000 persons now. And that is what we are aiming for. At our current rate, we are in a good position to achieve that target. Up until this point, up until Monday, so please understand where I'm coming from, in talks with PAHO, we are still on schedule to receive the balance of the COVAX shipment of 77,000 sometime in May 2021. And that is to add to the 73,000 we have now. So we are starting to be in a pretty good place as far as vaccine supply is concerned. As we deepen into phase one, we are now in a position to start in a small scale, phase two of our vaccination program where we start to vaccinate essential workers. This phase starts on Saturday in the first instance, and I've already written to all five benches of parliament. We'll be vaccinating all parliamentarians, upper house, lower house, and their spouses. We'll also be tackling senior public officers. And by next week, we are going to start local government personnel. So what we are trying to do is to keep central government, senior public officers, keep the public service at the senior level operating and local government. We consider these essential workers. In talks with my colleague, the Minister of National Security, we will start to vaccinate essential workers under the ambit of national security. This would include frontline police, frontline prisons, frontline immigration, frontline fire, etc., frontline coast guard, frontline defense force. Including, included in this under the Ministry of Finance will be frontline customs officers. So this is the start of phase two, and we always said depending on the number of vaccines, we can do things concurrently. So we'll be continuing with phase one, 
and with phase two we start this Saturday. It now falls to me uh, to bring some reality into the picture of COVID. You would have heard Dr. Trotman once again give her exhortations, her moral suasion. But when we look at figures, the week March the, March the 7th, the rolling day 7 average was around 3 to 7 cases per day over a seven day period. And because of the way we behaved and let our guards down collectively, many people still kept their guards up, but some of us kept put our guards down. By the week March 14th, that seven day rolling average started to rise to 10. By the week March 21st, it went up to 16. By the week March 28th, it went up to 26. And currently, Dr. Hines worked it out this morning, the seven-day rolling average, inclusive of yesterday, where we had a recent record-breaking day of 70 cases, it is now 42. So we moved from a very comfortable position of three to six in just over a month and one week to 42, an increase of roughly in the order of 12 times. These figures cannot be ignored. We also pay attention to our hospital occupancy rates. One month ago, they were 2 to 3% occupancy, which was not only comfortable, but extremely, extremely good. One month later, we are at 25%. What we are the ministry now have to do is to factor in the post-Easter surge, which will start to come this weekend, and ask ourselves, if we don't do something now, we will have another surge two weeks from now on top of our Easter surge, so our hospital occupancy is going to increase. We don't want our hospital occupancy to reach to the point where we can't flatten the curve. That will not be good for Trinidad and Tobago and for those who depend on us to provide them with health care to save their lives. After discussions this morning with the health team, Chief Medical Officer Dr. Hines, Dr. Trotman, the Minister of National Security, and ultimately the Honourable Prime Minister who makes the decisions. I have been authorised by the Honourable Prime Minister to announce the following measures, which will kick in for a three-week period starting at midnight tonight. One, there will be no longer allowed in-house dining in restaurants, bars, casinos and cinemas. So let me repeat, when these regulations kick in later tonight at 12 uh, p.m., there will be no more in-house dining in restaurants, bars, casinos and cinemas. The simple logic, as Dr. Trotman has said, is to reduce congregation and to reduce the ability of the virus to jump from person to person in situations where masks cannot be worn. Masking is really the number one public health measure. So situations where masks cannot be worn um, will now um, be disallowed. We are also reducing public gatherings in public, again, from 10 persons back to 5 persons. But we urge, we urge persons, the same 5 persons with masking in the public domain, to please institute those same measures in your private settings, in your homes, in your personal gatherings. We are once again appealing to people, don't have um, limes in your houses, don't have limes in your homes, whether it's a birthday party, a little wedding, or whatever. 
these things are to be discouraged at this point in time. The third measure to discourage gatherings, we will go back to our position. We are all beaches in Trinidad and Tobago, inclusive, and I've been asked to make this point especially, inclusive of beaches down the islands, because there are those who believe down the islands is not part of Trinidad and Tobago. Down the islands is part of Trinidad and Tobago. So all beaches from midnight tonight will be closed to the public. The exception is going to be made for persons involved in the conservation activities for the leatherback turtles. They can still go on to their beaches in um, Matura, Grand River, um, wherever that these turtles nest and lay their eggs. So that conservation activity goes on unimpeded. So all beaches will be closed as of 12 p.m. tonight. The other issue which I've been asked to address and which has not been allowed since day one is that of partying and party boats. Party boats have always not been allowed. The Minister of National Security, whether it's in Trinidad or Tobago, tour boats are allowed, but the Minister of National Security is going to ask his law enforcement officers to make sure there is no music on boats, to make sure that masking can be maintained on boats and these tour boats. Do your business. We have no problem with that. We want people to earn a living. But we are asking people, situations where the party atmosphere takes over and good sense no longer prevails is what Dr. Trotman was speaking about. It gives the particles a chance and a virus to jump from person to person. We will be um, applying these measures for the next three weeks, 21 days. I have been asked to just reinforce in the public that whilst religious gatherings are allowed, we are asking all religious bodies to please um, comply with the regulations for 50%, make sure persons attending church services, mosques, or temples stick to the 50% capacity, and most importantly, make sure that once these persons are in your places of worship, masks are worn at all times. Do not encourage any activity in your places of worship which encourages people to take off their masks. We are hoping that these measures, together with the moral suasion of people like Dr. Trotman and everyone else, we can get the public's cooperation once again. What countries are fighting around the world now are two, two things, the COVID virus and COVID fatigue, which is a real phenomenon. And we understand that, that people want life to go back to how it was. At this point in time, that is not possible. So we ask persons, the way we were disciplined uh, up to a month ago, let's get back to that stage so that these measures which we are implementing for only 21 days can only be for 21 days. I think as a team, again, we did it once, we did it twice. I am sure that Team Trinidad and Tobago can do it again for a third time. So, Mr. Alexander, that is my uh, little presentation for this morning, and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. I now invite Dr. Brian Amor, the CEO SWRHA, to speak on some recent developments in the Southwest Regional Health Authority. Dr. Amor. Good morning, Honorable Minister of Health, Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Hines, Dr. Trotman, General Manager, of the Southwest Regional Health Authority, um, to all members of the media and the listening public, good morning. The specific issue that I've been asked to address, it relates to the information that would have come out in the public domain last night regarding concerns of 
a person who is under the care of South West Regional Health Authority regarding his condition and any relation to the AstraZeneca vaccine. As I would have indicated last night on one of the news channels, I'm indicating again for clarity to the general listening public that the South West Regional Health Authority has the position that there is no evidence at this time for any person who has a related condition that has been related to the issue of clots and the AstraZeneca vaccine. As a general point for edification, persons who would come for any general condition, there is normally a medical history. In the context of clots, there are certain risk factors and many other more common risk factors that would be elicited from the patient's history and from physical examination. Certainly at the South West Regional Health Authority, this patient, like others, are under specialist care and specialist assessment, and that has been done in the case of the patient, and as well as, in particular, noting side effects of the vaccine that's in the global literature. This has also been clinically evaluated. Um, at the request of the Ministry of Health, for which we at the South West have also taken proactive steps, we are compiling an internal report based on the findings that will be shared by, with the Chief Medical Officer of the Ministry of Health and the South West position for clarity to the public is that we have no evidence at this time that um, patient's condition of any patient it has any link in our care system that relates to the side effect of the AstraZeneca vaccine with the specific issue of national interest that is relates to clots at this time. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much Dr. Amor for that update. We now go to the question and answer segment. I would like to ask our media representatives to begin by stating your name and the name of the media house that you represent before you put forward your questions to our panelists. As a result of the time limitations, we are permitting no more than two questions per media house in the first instance. And if we have time, as you know, we will allow additional questions for, your, for the media representatives. We begin, with, we begin this morning with Wired 868. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Fayola Bustick, Wired 868. Uh, my first question has to do with uh, the incidence of the blood clotting. I know that um, you said that it was not, there's no evidence as yet that it was linked to the AstraZeneca vaccine. However, um, in the UK, they have said that there is a link between um, the vaccine and a very rare but serious adverse effect having to do with a specific type of blood clotting. So I'm just wondering, what is the um, protocol, the medical protocol for treating somebody with, um, who presents with that particular um, type of blood clotting? Because I know that some countries have released guidelines that they should be treated differently from how you treat ordinary blood clots. So what is the policy in Trinidad Tobago for how those types of blood clots should be treating should they arise? And um, also I'd like to know, second question is, are there any symptoms um, that people who have had the vaccine or who are about to have the vaccine should look out for um, to indicate whether or not they might be experiencing this clotting event? Thank you for your questions. Uh, CMO, could you address them? Right, Thank so I, I think you're asking, so two questions about the clinical guidelines. So we have based our clinical guidelines in Trinidad and Tobago on loosely on the UK guidelines that they have released, of course, being the initial point of manufacture and um, seeing the incident occurring in that setting. I had asked Dr. Kenneth Charles, who is the hematologist assigned to the Ministry of Health, to prepare a local version of the same, which he has done. And, and the clinicians, we are in the process of in actually training all the clinicians to deal with that particular guideline. But what, what we do is of course if you have a case that is suspicious of it we will enlist the clinical hematologist and they would guide the, the the further treatment thereafter it what it what it does cause is there's a link to a decrease in the platelets which normally cause your blood to clot um it's it is linked to a decrease in those um particular parameters in your blood so there is a clinical guideline using being utilized in front of that for it um and it says it is very similar to the uk guideline Talking generally about the, the situation, you mentioned that it's very rare and it's something that can't be underscored enough. It is, in terms of incidence, what they have noted in the international population, it's anywhere between 
four out of a million in terms of cases what they have noted in deaths is one per million so when you look at COVID-19 for example and you're looking at plot, plotting incidents in someone that would have COVID you're looking at 16.5 percent which is 165,000 cases per million so it, it is all about benefits versus risk um, weighing that out and of course seeking the guidance of your clinician prior to having any vaccine or even any medication so it is advisable if you think you may be at risk that you do seek the guidance of your clinician before you have any vaccine um, in terms of signs and symptoms what i would suggest is that the normal signs and symptoms we have picked up in trinidad and other parts of the world which are the much less rare effects side effects are of course fever pain at the injection site lethargy those are the main ones that people have been having are the common symptoms um, if you see if you want to look out for symptoms for this particular very rare side effect you're probably looking at bleeding um, signs of bleeding so bleeding under the bleeding of your gums you're looking at um, easy bruising of your skin those sorts of things it has been associated depends on the type of bleed with headaches as well so if you see anything that is unusual post vaccination contact your healthcare practitioner and let them do a full assessment so that we have the advice going forward huh? thank you very much CMO we now go to CNC3 hi morning everyone Rashad Khan Guardian Media Limited okay so my two questions are for both the CMO and the Minister of Health my first question is those vaccines which we received from India can you um, give us the shelf life or when that would be expected to expire. And my second question is again, to link back to that clotting issue. Um, the Ministry of Health is supposed to be monitoring persons who would have received the COVID-19 vaccine. So of these 10,000 people who would have gotten it so far, has anyone had any sort of adverse reaction? And if not linked to the vaccine, has any one of these people who have received the vaccine um, showed any signs of um, could incidentally having an adverse reaction. Thank, thank you, Richard. Um, I'll take the first question. So maybe you missed it, but when I was speaking initially, I did indicate that the expiry dates of the COVID shield vaccines we received last night is in fact July 18th. But I welcome the opportunity to reiterate. Thank you. So, so yes. Um, in terms of the side effects, we have noted side effects. Um, the majority of them have been mild fever, as I said, joint pains, there's lethargy. A few persons have, have indicated that they may have had um, diarrhea for a couple of days. Most instances think everything would have resolved within 48 to 72 hours, which is as per the phase three trials that we are seeing all over the world and the phase four ongoing trials. Um, so more or less, they have been mild to the most part. Um, I haven't received any reports of adverse or anaphylactic type reaction needing people to be hospitalized. So no reports have come to my office as yet um, relating to that sort of severe allergic type reaction. Other than that, mainly mild side effects have been noted. Thank you, CMO. We now go to 98.1. Good morning, uh, Mr. Alexander, and um, of course the uh, entire panel. Stephen Cummings and 98.1. FM, uh, my two questions um, for Minister Dial Singh. And uh, I must say that I missed some of the audio. I think we were having some uh, slight technical audio problems. So um, I, I didn't get all of what you know was being said um, coming uh, over to this end. Uh, nonetheless, um, my two questions uh, quickly. Concerns, uh, Minister, um, uh, you know, continue to be raised about vaccines, uh, delays, uh, suspensions, and administering of the vaccines in several EU countries. And uh, there is the Johnson & Johnson case uh, being among the latest. Now, are you confident that in Trinidad and Tobago, we will be able to meet our set inoculation targets um, against what uh, clearly are levels of heightened fears, um, uncertainties, and access volatility in the market, despite our COVAX uh, guarantees? And um, secondly, we have seen a very high number of infections from the last report by the ministry. Um, you may have a different descriptive, but you know, um, I, I will describe it as a stunningly alarming 70, 
70 new infections. Is it that the messaging, uh, Minister, has so far not been working in that we are seeing more um, in the last weeks, uh, more people being infected uh, with the virus? Is there a need to change the messaging to ensure that the health guidelines are adhered to? We've used the legislative route, and you've just, men uh, you've just you know, outlined some new measures. Um, is there something more that we um, should be doing or can do? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Cummins. And you asked two pretty um, relevant questions. So let's take the first one first about delays and suspensions and so on. Um, we always pay attention to the international evidence. And these delays, and if you really follow the reasons for the delays and suspension, is out of an abundance of caution. And the CMO did give the statistics. So I will let him deal with that. Um, let, let me deal with the second issue, whether the messaging is working. I think we could all agree that this issue of COVID fatigue is a global issue. I, I follow what health ministers, presidents, prime ministers, public health experts are doing around the world. And the message is always the same. People are just tired. It's not only Trinidad and Tobago. People want life to go back to how it was in January 2020. That isn't possible at this point in time. So we continue to urge persons. You had Dr. Trotman again this morning in her usual style. And this is what people around the world are doing. Continue to do several things. Moral suasion, legislative um, measures. But we are so lucky in Trinidad and Tobago as opposed to other countries near and far where we have not implemented states of emergencies. We have not implemented curfews. We have not suspended your constitutional rights. Our economy is fairly open. Some sectors, yes, are, are affected. I mean, people are free to go and come, go to work, visit parties, parties. We can't legislate against parties. So, Mr. Cummins, your your concerns are well-founded, but we look at what is happening globally, and the issue of COVID fatigue is a real one globally, and we are part of a global pandemic. It is happening all around the world, so we continue with the moral suasion, we continue with the messaging, and we continue with the legislative measures. We are always looking at new ways to communicate and new messages to give out. So thank you very much, and I hand over to the CMO to expand on question one. Yep. So, so I mean, um, not more, much more expansion in terms of what I said about Astra, the AstraZeneca vaccine. So it seems like a similar concern is happening in the U.S. and and they would have held on the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. Again, once you once you begin to expand into phase four of a vaccine and you do it at such a large scale, for example, if you have one debt in a million for for this type of adverse reaction, and you use ninety million doses, you expect to get 90 such incidents occurring. So um, that is what you're seeing now in phase four. There is concern to ensure that, of course, we know which if that it doesn't go beyond that in terms of its prevalence. But um, every territory has its sovereign right to hold out of caution in the interim. We look to WHO or the, or the governing body in the particular area for guidance when something occurs outside of our region and we continue to await WHO's guidance as it relates to both AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson in this regard. But let me, let me just add in here, because Mr. Cummins, you have raised an issue. So, CMO, mm -hmm. this current suspension of Johnson & Johnson is six adverse events sure? in how many millions of doses? Quite a large number. I got and it has boiled down to one case per million. Similar to the AstraZeneca. Let me ask a quick question. What would have been the death rate if you had those one million people with COVID? So much based on based on a roughly 5% sort of death rate, you will get, of course, much, much more. Yeah. We're looking at, you know, yeah. quite a lot more. And that is what people are saying. You have to look at the risk versus the benefits. All right? So thank you, Mr. Cummins. Thank you very much. Um, we now go to AZP News. Hi, good morning. Pry Bihari, AZPnews.com. Um, I just wanted to clarify, um, I know the Prime Minister always speaks about the science. So I wanted to find out, does the science show that the in-house dining in bars, restaurants, casinos, etc., 
is causing this upsurge? And, and or in, in other words, where is this upsurge coming from? My second question, um, yesterday at the press conference of, of the PHA, they said that the Prime Minister had 35 contacts that were in Tobago. And there were also some in Trinidad. I just wanted to know what are the numbers in Trinidad? And if it is the norm that if someone is a primary contact of somebody who has COVID in Tobago, is that person allowed to travel back to Trinidad to be in isolation? Okay. Thank you. All right. Yeah. So, so your first question, um, sorry, the, the, with regard to your second question, we're talking about um, Dr. Hoyt would have indicated in terms of the Prime Minister's contact. And what she would have said is that the cases that were picked up in Tobago, they, in the event that they would not have been picked up at the time that they were in Tobago, she would have liaised with her counterparts in Trinidad to continue the contact tracing, make sure they were quarantined and, of course, swabbed as, as necessary. So if the case was picked up while they were in Tobago, what is the, the normal protocol is that they actually quarantined in Tobago. If we pick it up thereafter, then, of course, they quarantined in Trinidad. So it's not that we allow a primary contact or secondary contact to travel from Trinidad to, to, to Tobago. Once you are confirmed as a contact, you stay where you are, either island. All right. Um, the first question, if you could just remind me quickly, prior. Sorry. Right. So, so the 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 rationale behind, yeah. So, not here. Right. So the rationale, generally speaking, we're looking at two things. When you look at restrictions, and as Dr. Trotman said, we're looking at spread from person to person by droplet infection. So we're looking at the way the disease have has moved from one person to the next. So mainly areas where persons have not been able to wear your mask obviously when you when you're having a meal you can't wear a mask during that point in time and you have large groups of people together not wearing a mask and we are trying to look at even larger groups of individuals who come together so we're trying to stop two things one congregation as you noted we decreased the number of persons that from 10 to 5 and as well as we're trying to target situations where people will be present when they can't wear their masks for any length of time and in close proximity to each other. So those two scenarios, based on the public health, um, the guidance, and based on the actual transmission of this particular disease, have been what we have used as our benchmark to actually decrease the risk or the chance of spreading from one person to the next. Thank you, CMO. We now move to IETV. IETV, I think you need to unmute your mic, please. Unmute your mic. Okay. Ah. Is that... We are hearing you now. Go ahead. We are here from IETV. I have two short questions, please. Um, my first question is, can the minister or the CMO give us an update as to the combined for the vaccination drive? Um, I know the CEO of the MWRJ on Monday, she said that for example, um, she is seeing a lot of success in her area with persons calling and so on. Now, ITV news, we try to call Central and South to make appointments and to find out about appointments. And um, we received feedback that the mailbox was either full or no one answered the line. Is there a reason for that? As well as, I know Minister went on record to say that persons who are registered for NCD clinics, for example, heart patients, and diabetes patients, they will be inoculated for their next clinic appointment. Um, but for the clarity of the public, um, um, persons in other clinics, for example, an eye clinic or an orthopedic clinic, will they be inoculated at their next appointment as well? Thank you. Okay, so, so with regards to your second question, so persons in the NCD clinic, as you know, we are looking at persons over 60 with an NCD, as a target population at this point in time and we are targeting persons who are coming to the peripheral clinic meaning the the 23 clinics at the health center level um, so there are some peripheral clinics sometimes they do outreach for ophthalmology for example but you have to meet the criteria of having a chronic disease and being over 60 and once you do meet those criteria you will be offered at the 23 centers um, in Trinidad. I don't know if Dr. Moore is still there. But uh, look, before we go yeah. to Dr. Moore, there's, there's one item. Mm -hmm. All of this depends on the availability and number of vaccines. Right. Okay? I just want to put that out, out there. 
Thank you. Dr. Moore. So, so right. Right, thank you for the question. With respect to the issue with the um, calling and the um, mailbox message versus WhatsApp, um, I can speak for South West Regional Health Authority. Yes, on Monday we had a very temporary issue for a couple hours where because of the volume of calls, um, we did have an issue with the mailbox becoming filled, which was easily cleared by around lunchtime Monday. So um, that was a temporary issue, and that has since been resolved. We have increased the number of lines um, so that persons, when they call, they can certainly speak to someone, and we, you get an appointment at the same time. Um, what is on the screen are the numbers um, for the SWRHA. The WhatsApp, based on direction from the ministry, was launched only on Monday around 12 p.m. at the South West Regional Health Authority, and the WhatsApp, is, that is where you can send a message. What we have found is that um, despite saying this, members of the public are sending messages to all three WhatsApp numbers as per what's on the screen. But it, it, those three numbers means you can send a message to either one of those three phones and just one of the WhatsApp numbers is required to send a message and we do reply and we do also set appointments. The WhatsApp messaging is not to make calls on those numbers, it's to send a message. So there are two methods, which is also the case with my colleague CEOs and their respective RHAs, it's WhatsApp numbers to send a WhatsApp message to make an appointment, which we know is easy and convenient for several persons. And then, yes, the system that was there before the WhatsApp that is still in place for the public, the 87 Swara. Um, the system that we have, if we miss a call, we are able to recognize that a call is missed, and our protocol is that we also return any missed calls. The number of missed calls has declined remarkably, apart from what started up last week. And what was described as teaching problems, as, the, as we were very happy for the overwhelming response. But as of this week, the, the missed calls from, from the data that I see is very minimal, single digits, three to five, and we promptly return missed calls because we could see it on our call, ses, on, on our call center system. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Amor. Uh, we now go to TV6. We are ready for your questions. Good morning, everyone. Urvashi from TV6. Um, Minister Dialsing would have said a short while ago that a decision was taken to use all 33,600 COVAX vaccines as a first dose. Um, but given that the expiration date of the COVID shield is July 18th, then according to my calculations, in order to use the COVID shield as a second dose, if we're sticking with that three month interval, then all your first doses, um, the 33,600 would have to be administered three months before that July 18th date, which is April 18th. That's four days from now. If 10,000 have been administered, then we should ideally be looking to administer 23,600. Um, can I get an update uh, or could the CMO please explain the vaccine schedule? Um, so that's my first question. Um, the second question, as dates to the public health measures, you've set a three-week target. Um, Dr. Parastra, um, ideally, was... Over she? We are having some technical um, connection issues. Could you repeat your second question? Second question. Um, Sec measures, a three-week target has been set. Um, the adjustments, that's the in-house dining, the closure features, um, five person in public places. I'm asking the CMO Okay. All right, um, so could we take the first, first question answer. and we'll get back? Yes, we'll get back to Urshan. All right, so, so your first question um, basically speaks to the schedule for the second dose of AstraZeneca. The WHO recommends that we give the second dose of AstraZeneca anywhere between 8 weeks and 12 weeks. So based on your, your calculation, you were using a schedule of 12 weeks only. So we will have to give certain persons as we continue to roll out the vaccination program. Um, right now we're giving 12 weeks because we can get the full 12 weeks up to, as you said, the 18th. But once we cross that date, we'll have to go anywhere between 8 and 12 weeks based on where we are in terms of time of administration. So it will fall within the 8 to 12 week window for most of the people. 
Yeah. And we hope to complete the first 33,000 within a time that will allow us to give the second dose at least shortest eight weeks. Yeah. I, th I, th I, think, I think what we have to understand is a range, mm -hmm. eight to 12 weeks. So don't only calculate it on 12 weeks alone. Um, that will be slightly misleading. It's a range. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister CMO. And mm -hmm. um, we now go to Radio Tamarin. You ready for your question? Yes, good morning. Clayton Clark, Radio Tamron. My question is about, uh, has there been any sort of assessment uh, of the pandemic impact on the school system? We're getting reports of teachers and principals complaining about teachers, not just the students, but teachers, the ability to cope with this new online teaching, which is more or less into one year of operation. So any sort of review, compilation of data. And the second question, um, it's regards to the state situation with the prime minister. Um, we are not aware of, well, the persons are contact, under contact tracing as was announced yesterday, but in terms of, for example, you, Mr. Health Minister, have you been in contact with the prime minister, um, other ministers, you know what what's the position on that i mean it's we, okay. we were told yesterday we need to speak to the prime minister to comment on that but i, th I think this is a matter of people would like to know of sure. what's the state of, of our ministers our parliamentarians okay with regards to the positive test by the prime minister thank you for your question thank you so the answer to your first question which is a very relevant question uh clayton but that question is best posed to the minister of education uh to see what they are doing there, but we at Health always support our system ministries. On the issue of myself and contact with the Prime Minister, I think Dr. Hines, we sent out a detailed release. You contact Trace, and Dr. Hines, I want you to come in to reiterate the difference between the incubation period and the infectious period, because I think this is where the conversation unfortunately is being twisted by those who should know better not yourself not yourself <laughs> clayton the last time i was physically in the same place with the prime minister was saturday the 25th or 26th dr hines will tell you again that you contact trace two to three days maximum before the onset of symptoms so I was way outside the WHO and CDC parameters to be contact traced. And there has been no change in those protocols because it's the Prime Minister. The leader of the opposition and those aligned to her are trying to use this to say that we have changed the contact tracing protocols. So let me reiterate. The last time I was physically in the same room with the Honorable Prime Minister was at his press conference on the 25th or 26th of March, which is way before the infectious period, as Dr. Hines will go into again, which is two to three days before anybody, regardless if it's the Prime Minister, uh, the person who um, cleans, whatever. We have stuck to protocol. But unfortunately, um, there are those who sit opposite in the parliament who are intent of making an issue after this. And I turn over to Dr. Hines to give you the science behind this. Thank you, Minister. Uh, just to reiterate quickly, this is a basic virology and communicable disease uh, biology one-on-one. -on -one. A virus or any transmissible agent has to get into your body, replicate, and then begin to shed from your system one way or the other in order for you to be infectious. Now, what has been noted through the 133 million cases that have been uh, documented globally is that for the COVID-19 uh, causing virus, that SARS coronavirus 2, this virus does not begin to shed from your respiratory system or any other part of your system before approximately two days in advance of the onset of symptoms. This is not unique to SARS coronavirus. 
There are other viruses that do something quite similar. Just a couple days before your prodrome for chickenpox, for measles, uh, for the flu, you get the ability to shed virus just one or two days before that, and that is what's called your infectious period. Now, the incubation period is a period between the time when your body has been exposed to and infected by an infectious agent and the time where you show symptoms. So the time frame between exposure and your manifestation of symptoms, your showing symptoms, is your incubation period. That, in coronavirus uh, terms, spans between two at the short end and 14 at the long end days. Now, if we source trace, i.e. going backward, we would need to look at how far back uh, we need to look for a potential source of infection. And that can go back as far as 14 days, which is a completely separate thing from contact tracing, where contact tracing looks at who you, the infected case, would have exposed to your infectious self at the point in time when you were infectious. For that, the CDC and the WHO guidelines both indicate that contact solicitation, looking for contacts, is done up to two days before the onset of symptoms. The media release that we would have released on Monday gives both the excerpt and the link that can be clicked on so that anyone so wishing to do can read the documents for themselves. So no one who is in contact with the Prime Minister more than two days in advance of his onset of symptoms would be of relevance with respect to contact tracing his contacts. And the date that we would have uh, had the press conference would have been the 27th of March, and the Parliament would have been on the 26th of March. That's far in advance of the two days before April 5th, two days before April 5th being April 3rd. So the simple, very basic math and basic, bi basic biology stands, and it stands internationally. Nothing has been changed. These are the international, the global guidelines as outlined by both the WHO and the CDC. I hope that that makes the issue a lot clearer. Thanks so much for the clarification. For the, for the clarification, and we have room for just one more question um, from TTT. Good morning, everyone. Kimberly D'Souza from TTT News. Um, Minister, my questions are for you, so I'll go really, really quickly. Um, of the 40,000 uh, COVID shield vaccines that we received from India, can you indicate how many uh, will be given to Tobago? That's one. Um, now, Minister, I know this is an education question, but a lot of our um, followers have been asking us about this. We're seeing an increase in cases, but still standards, well, form fours and fives are still being asked to come out um, to complete their practicals. I'm not sure if it is you can pass the information on to Minister Nian Gaspi Dolly so she can respond to that. And also one more question, Minister, um, in the restrictions, you didn't mention gyms or any of the events that maybe happened in, you know, covered spaces such as auditoriums. Will those be restricted as well? Thanks. Okay, so the restrictions are exactly uh, what I indicated. I, I don't think I omitted at anything, but thanks for uh, raising it. The allocation of vaccines is done on a national level, and we will sit again, as we always do, with the chief medical officer, his counterpart in Tobago, to make sure that the vaccines are equitably distributed throughout the country. But right now, we are not right now, as things stand now, we are not distributing what we received last night. That has an expiry of July 18th. What we are distributing now is the COVAX shipment, which has an expiry date of May 31st. So I think your question was, are we distributing what we received last night? The answer for that right now is no, because you always use out first what is expiring the earliest. Okay? So thank you, Kimberly. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We have come to the end of this, this press conference. The Ministry of Health thanks you for joining us for today's media conference. Remember that even though we continue to have high uptake of the COVID-19 vaccine, everyone must continue to follow the health guidelines. It's as simple as three W's. Watch your hands, watch your distance from others, and wear your mask. Follow the three W's, and if you are a frontline healthcare worker over 60 years of age or have any non-communicable disease, go get vaccinated.
This is TTT. Live for local. I solemnly pledge to dedicate.